Thank you. Here today to talk to you about Human Hacking Exposed, six preventative tips that can save your company. A little bit about me. Um, mentioned before, my name is Chris Hadnagy online. I'm known as Logan WHD. I am a professional social engineer. That means what I do for work is companies hire me to find the vulnerabilities and weaknesses within their people network, um, either through on-site visits, phishing, web, email, things like that. I have wrote a book called uh, Social Engineering, The Art of Human Hacking, as well as the podcast and the framework and other things that you can find out online about me. But today, uh, the topic of social engineering is, is a very important topic, in, in my opinion, of course. I'm a little biased. Uh, but th before we can even talk about it, we need to define what social engineering is. Now, I define it as any act that influences a person to take an action that may or may not be in their best interest. That's a very broad and general definition, I know. But the reason I define it that way is I don't always think that social engineering is negative. Your parents, your spouse, your teachers, your priest, your counselor, all of them use aspects of persuasion or influence to get you to take an action that is for your best interest. But those same influence principles, those same persuasion principles and manipulation tactics are used by the bad guys. And that's the type of social engineering that we're talking about today. The reason this kind of a topic is so important is last year, 2011, was labeled the year of the hack. And this is just a small um, sampling of the companies that fell victim to uh, hacktivists and hacking attacks last year. And one interesting part about each one of these attacks, in an interview from a member of Anonymous, her, name, her nickname was uh, Sparky Blaze, she said in, in an interview in Network World that in my mind social engineering is the biggest issue today. Now, why did she say that? In the rest of the interview, she went on to say that in every attack on these companies, that they used some form of social engineering to gain access to the networks. So this is a very timely topic. It's a topic that we really need to discuss, how we can prevent ourselves and our companies, even down to our family level and our personal level, from becoming victim. Why else we should care? This uh, website, apwg.org, is an anti-phishing work group. Uh, does a report each and every year, talks about how phishing is affecting uh, the markets. Well, in the first quarter of 2011, you can see how the financial and payment services market were hit heavily by phishing attacks. And it doesn't really leave uh, much, if you can take a look there at the chart, you can see that almost every sector that we would be a part of was hit by phishing attacks. This kind of calls to mind a report I read about the IRS uh, where I think it was just two or three years ago, the IRS um, submitted themselves to a social engineering pen test. Uh, so this was a, a legal hired for pen test. And in that pen test, 60% of the folks that were tested from the IRS fell for this very simple social engineering test. I'll demonstrate it for you. Hello, this is Paul. I'm calling from the help desk. Um, we are doing a password upgrade due to new security policies, and I'd like you to type in a new password I'm going to give you. Do you know how to do that? person on the other end of the phone. Yes, I do. Okay, well then open up the password box and type in 1234 password. Click OK, OK, and now you are secure. 60% of the people that were asked to do that from the IRS actually fell victim and did that. If this was an actual malicious attack, I can't imagine the devastation that would have caused um, many of us being taxpayers and them having our information. The former vice president of threat research from McAfee says, I'm convinced that every company and every conceivable industry with significant size and valuable intellectual property and trade secrets has been compromised or will be soon. I actually subscribe to this belief, even though it's a very bold statement, especially seeing what's been happening in 2011 and continuing on until this year the amount of organizations and companies that have fallen victim to hacking attacks, many of them involving social engineering. So these six tips that we're going to discuss are vital for us today. They're important that we apply them and that we learn from them so that we cannot become victim, that we are not victims of social engineering attacks. The first is learning to identify social, social engineering attacks. If you haven't heard of a famous social engineer who uh, wrote a couple of books, his name is Johnny Long. He wrote a book called No Tech Hacking. And I had this one engagement that I was hired to do for a large international organization. In the back of their building, they felt very secure because they had these massive iron doors with bulletproof glass. That little, you, even if you broke it, you couldn't have snuck through. There was a couple thousand pound magnetic locks on these things. On the outside, there was no locks that could have been picked. Inside, it was all motion detection. Outside, it was all RFID. So they felt pretty secure. And due to that, they put no security in the back of their building. 
thinking that no one would be able to gain access that way. But after reading Johnny's book, I was looking for something, and that was in between the two doors, there was a gap, maybe about a half an inch to an inch big. Uh, Because of the engagement, I was wearing a tie, and in my knapsack, I always have a coat and wire hanger. It's the social engineer's best friend. Unraveled the wire hanger, put my tie in the end, shoved it through the one-inch quarter crack in the doors, waved it in front of the motion detector, and voila, 2,000-pound magnetic locks bypassed by a tie and a hanger. So what does this tell you? They wouldn't have thought of that uh, because they weren't aware of the social engineering attacks that are being used today on companies. So becoming aware of these attacks, knowing what kind of attacks are being used and how they're being implemented, is the first essential preventative tip. If we don't know what's being used, then we can't possibly prevent against it. So becoming uh, aware of it using information gathering tools upon uh, our security teams or IT teams or even personally knowing what's happening in the market is a, big, is a big preventative tip for us. Our second tip talks about security awareness. Now, security awareness um, for many of us that work with organi- within organizations, unfortunately, tends to be maybe a DVD that you slap in, you watch, you put a checkbox that you actually took that training, maybe 45, 50, 60 minutes at a time, and it's impersonal, and it's boring, and it's obviously not working in the, in the industry. We can see by the attacks uh, last year that many of the victims that fell for it fell for attacks that were very simplistic, like the ones for the IRS. So, so security awareness needs to become something personal. In one engagement that I had uh, doing information gathering on the employees, I found an employee who was running an RC racing car um, club. Nothing wrong with that. The company didn't care. He wasn't moonlighting. He just ran this little club on the side. People paid a small fee, and they were able to come race RC cars on the weekends. But he was using his corporate email account um, on his Facebook page where he advertised the service. So we were able to play a part. I was now Jim, and I was interested in learning how to race RC cars, especially the one I just got for my birthday. And I had some pictures on this, on this website of my new RC car that I wanted him to check out and see if he can help me learn how to race this car efficiently. And of course, now we had similar likes. It was very personal. He clicked on the link, and the company was breached. What does this, what does this have to do with security awareness? Well, the reason it worked, it was personal. It was personal, and it was something that was between him and I, and it it was an interest of his. Security awareness needs to apply those same exact principles. If you want it to work, it should be something personal, something that that is uh, very um, deeply involving the, the individual that you're trying to train. And if you do that, then you'll have success in your security awareness training. Our preventative tip number three, this is kind of an interesting one. Employees need to understand the value of the information that they possess. Another story that came to my mind thinking about um, this this question on the bottom, is your waste disposal company important to you? Well, many of us would say, well, of course they are. They take the garbage out. But many of us wouldn't think that it's a very valuable piece of information. In one engagement, we called the accounts Uh, receivable department, and we said, hey, this is Larry. I'm calling from ABC Waste Disposal, new company in town. I'm going to be sending you a quote. I built a rapport with her over the phone, and after a few minutes was able to ask her, so who is your present waste disposal company? She gave me the name. I said, okay, I'll be emailing you a quote shortly. The quote never came, but what I did is I went to the website of the company that they use. I grabbed the logo from the website. Uh, you go online, you find a $5 printing, shirt printing company, had a hat and a shirt printed with that logo on it. I then called the security desk and said, hey, this is Jim over at, and we won't say the name of the waste disposal company, I'm going to send Paul down tomorrow because he's got to check out your dumpster. We got a call from Michelle in the AER department saying that it was damaged. He puts the name Paul on the security checklist. The next day, I come with my shirt, my hat, and the clipboard, Clipboard makes you official, doesn't it? No matter what you're doing, if you have a clipboard, you're official. So a clipboard made me official. I didn't even need to go through security. They let me right in, pointed me in the direction of the dumpsters, and now I'm doing a dumpster dive in the middle of the day, collecting all of their paper trash, able to go through and find the documents that we needed to perform the breach. Critical thinking is key in this preventative measure. Teaching employees to understand that the value of the information that they possess even what seems like innocuous little pieces of data can cause a breach. And it's important to know that when we give out information, that the person we're giving it to deserves that information, and that the question that was being asked is uh, they have the right to ask it. It's a very important uh, tip here for prevention of social engineering attacks. 
This is, a, this is one that's a hard one. Software updates, security updates. Why? It's time consuming and it's expensive, isn't it? If you have a large organization, so I stand up here and I say this very easily, but I understand the pain that it takes to update thousands of clients and their security software or their user software that they have, like browsers and PDF software and things like that. It could be very time consuming and costly to do that. But there was a company that I worked with, a printing company, that uh, when we scanned their servers, we found that in their public web server, they had a couple PDFs. The two that we honed in on was one that they made, which gave us the type of PDF software they used, the version, and because it was a recent one, we figured that's probably still the one they use. And the second one was from a local cancer drive for, um, for a charity drive for cancer for children. I know it sounds horrible to do this, but we use that in the social engineering test because that's what a malicious person would do. We called the company, playing that we were from a local uh, cancer drive. We wanted to send them a PDF that would outline the benefits of going with us as opposed to other cancer drives, and we would like to have their benefit, um, them support our benefit. Of course, the CEO accepted the PDF because it was something very personal for him, and while on the phone, we were able to cause a breach due to outdated software. Vulnerable software is a key way that attackers find their way inside your network. If they can scan and they can see an old FTP server, old browsers, old um, PDF reading software, any kind of software that's old and has public exploits, you are definitely vulnerable. And that's just the public exploits. There's also exploits that are not public, those that are not published, zero days that may just be coming out. So this is a very, very big preventative tip. It's important, even though we know that it's not difficult, or that it is difficult, and it can be expensive. You know, when I talk about this one, the fifth one, developing scripts, some people look at me a little crazy because if you ever heard me talk about anything on the podcast, you know I hate scripts. You ever call your cell phone company, you get on the phone and you're irate, right? They messed up your bill, they, they charge you for something that you didn't do, and you call them and you, you're yelling at them and you're upset, and then you, you, they say to you, sorry, we can't help you. And before they hang up, they have the audacity to say, thank you for calling so-and-so, have a nice day. You just want to reach to the phone, don't you? That's a script. I'm not talking about that kind of a script. That kind of a script is not something that I'm actually talking about. I'm talking about thinking ahead critically about things that will happen. How will you handle them when they happen? I worked with a company, a, a client that we consulted, that had no policies or procedures for how they would handle things. Something very simple, like when you have to fire an employee. It's an unfortunate event, but it happens. Well, this company, they had an employee that was moonlighting, and it was something that broke company policy. They decided they had to let him go. When they called him in the office and they sat him down, he was agreeable. He actually understood. He was so friendly. He said, I know what I was doing was wrong, and I knew if I got caught, I'd have to leave. So I'm with you guys. Thanks, Thanks for you know, being cool about it. Meeting was about 4.30, you know, at the end of the day. He said, listen, I don't want to be embarrassed walking out in front of everybody. Is it okay if I just take the next half an hour, clean up my office, take my pictures home, and head out? All the CEOs, all the upper hands, they all felt good, patting them on the back, give them high fives. He seemed friendly enough, so they let him do it. Well, before he left, he erased 13 servers and all of their backups. 13 servers. I don't know if you can afford that. This company could not. Why? Because there was no scripts in place. There was no policies in place to say, here's the way we should handle it when this threat presents itself. Let's bring this down to a personal level. In your company, do you have a script in place to what to do if you've been social engineered or if you suspect you've been social engineered? You got an email, you didn't think, you clicked a link, something came up that wasn't what you were expecting. What do you do with that email? If you're not thinking of the answer right now, then you don't have a script in place. These are the kind of scripts I'm talking about. Having things in place that when you click the link, when you get that phone call, when someone approaches you, when you see someone shoulder surfing over when you're at the ATM, what are the next steps? What do you do to protect yourself from becoming a, a victim of social engineering? These are the kind of scripts that are necessary, and critical thinking is key in this preventative tip. And our final one, have and learn from audits. You know, this is a hard one, too. I've heard, in working with companies, I've heard everything from, you know, I don't want to have an audit because I know it's going to work <laughs> as social engineering. I know my, my people will fall for that. Two, my employees will never fall for social engineering, so we don't need it and everything in between. But having social engineering audits is important. 
it's important because what happens when you do is you may see, hey, guess what? We're not susceptible to phishing. Our guys know how to handle this. But wow, on the phone, they really give out too much information. Knowing those little tidbits can help you to develop the scripts, to develop security awareness, to really work backwards in security. Audits also, one key thing that I always like to promote is just because you get a 300-page report doesn't mean that the guy did a good job. Okay? Quantity does not always measure quality. So a social engineering audit should be something that is, that is purposeful, that is directed towards your company, and, that, and the audit report should show you exactly what you need to do in order to fix the problems. And really that brings us to tying it all together. When you want to tie something together, really at, at what I could have done here is just work backwards in these six slides. The first step is having that audit. Once you have that audit and you see where you're weak and you see where you're strong, you'll know what scripts to develop. You'll know where to train your people. You'll know what the security awareness should be about. Right? If, if, again, let's use that example. If your employees are great about phishing, they don't click on emails, you know, you, they don't fall for those kind of attacks, then giving them a 60-minute DVD to watch about phishing very well may be a waste of their time and they're disengaged. But if they're weak on the phone, then that's where you need to spend your time educating your employees. So having a clear action plan to put it all together is very, very important. Knowing what needs to happen and when it needs to happen and how it needs to happen is, is really what every company should strive to do. Working backwards towards success means that taking each one of these six steps making a clear written plan. I like writing plans out. For me, that's an important piece. Once you write something out, it seems to be committed to memory and you'll follow through. Once you do that, I can't guarantee, again, that you'll never fall victim to social engineering, but there's an old, I saw an old comic once that kind of made me laugh. There was a, a guy who was going to run from a hungry bear and he had two choices who was going to run next to him. One was a marathon runner and one was a big guy like me. Who do you want running next to you when you're running from a hungry bear? Me, right? Because I'm going to run slow, so you're not going to get eaten. So, <laughs> so the, the comic made sense on the fact that this is what's happening today in the hacking world. When you're running, when you're running your business and you're running from the hackers, what you want to happen is you want to not be the low-hanging fruit. You want to be as secure as possible so when they're looking for a target, then their eyes are not set upon you. These six tips can help you do that. Thanks for coming out, and if you want to get any more information or contact me with any questions, you can do so on social-engineer.com or there's my email address. Thanks.